Welcome everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to Angelo Robles's Effective Family Office podcast, where I look to distill the best practices and best ideas of the world's most successful families and their family offices. I hope to provide thought-provoking opinions and feature amazing thought leaders to our listeners of the podcast with an eye towards the future of the family office. Today's discussion, real estate, challenges and opportunities during and post COVID-19. We're doing a little bit of a complex online meeting and podcast today where I don't just have one or sometimes two participants, I actually have three. So let's hope I could manage and juggle that. Real estate is such an important asset class for so many people of wealth. It really is one of the anchor asset classes for many and practically all will have some real estate exposure. I've not really covered during the COVID-19 crisis real estate, so I wanted to really do it with a big bang and have not just one or two, but three amazing participants that are all, uh, effectively all single family offices and investors in their own right, but all really focused on something different within real estate, which is complex and has many different aspects to it. So having on three, I thought would be incredibly valuable to the audience. I'd like to introduce them. Lonnie Ginger, CEO of Wilkinson Family of Companies. His expertise is gonna be most focused on multifamily housing. Moses Gross, CEO of a and Group, focused on the redevelopment of malls into mixed use projects. That will be interesting. Bill Lapis, family office and CEO of Woodbridge Capital Partners, more of a focus on mini storage and student housing. I'm going to read, because I think it helps to give some context, the very, very shortened, my version of a shortened bio for each, then we'll get right to it. Lonnie Ginger is noted as the CEO of Wilkinson Corporation, a national real estate investment an operations platform that has transacted over 2.3 billion of real estate, creating strong impact results. We will get to that impact part of it as well. Moses Gross is noted founder of AM, is an entrepreneurial spirit, and his talent for identifying growth opportunities has led him to build his real estate firm, AM, which successfully manages and has developed real estate and overseas multiple transactions a year while continuing to consult with families on properties and construction improvements. Bill Lapis has over 33 years of finance and investment experience, 15 years with Morgan Stanley, ran a hedge fund, 18 years operating an RIA and family office, and is an active investor in real estate and securities. He's going to have more of a focus in our discussion today on self-storage, which again is also going to be what we all know to be an opportunity. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Let's get right to it. We're going to start first, and I'm going to bounce around consistently to all three of our participants. We're going to start first with Lonnie. Uh, Lonnie, you have multiple relationships with ultra-high net worth families and family office investors. What is the sediments kind of on the street that you're hearing about investing in real estate right now from your significant base of incredibly wealthy families, billionaires, and family offices? Yeah, great question, Angelo. I think for the last uh, few weeks, uh, many investors have had a bit of a wait and see mentality. Um, I think most portfolio managers are taking a, at least a 30 to 60 day hold stance on any major portfolio investment decisions. But what I've noticed since we're talking about real estate is there is a growing sentiment of optimism about the potential for some really good buying opportunities on the horizon um, in some segments of real estate, which I'm sure we'll talk about today, which, which of those make sense and which don't. Um, but we, we are seeing the, the execution of some real estate acquisitions and sales uh, already being stalled or stopped by market volatility. Uh, we've seen deals get extended and some deals get canceled altogether due to usually the inability to, to wrap up uh, previously approved financing. Uh, lenders obviously are becoming more hesitant to lend and are changing lending terms in this environment. Um, but what's interesting to me is that despite the uh, disrupted flow of financing, or maybe partly because of it, uh, we're seeing appetite for real estate uh, investing actually on the rise. I've spoken with a few 
uh, investors and, and family office investors um, in the last couple of weeks who are uh, quite eager to reduce exposure to public equities markets and increase investments in income producing real estate. And you know, over the last uh, year and a half, I've talked with many family offices and other investors who, who like real estate and already were talking about holding off on new investments and um, a lot of us sitting on significant liquidity until the next downturn happens. And it's, it's people like this who are now starting to see that um, there could be some great buying opportunities on the horizon. And, you know, our, our team has uh, built a pretty good track record, which of course is partially based on the fundamental of buying right and on all of our full cycle value add multifamily funds over the last 28 years, we've provided an average IRR uh, net of fees of over 20%. And there's many reasons for that, but one of the most fundamental <laughs> reasons is that our focus is, has always been on buying properties at a fraction of replacement costs and then creating significant value over the hold. So, you know, we have investors who've been with us during previous downturns over the last, you know, 28 to 29 years. Uh, and in some cases, their children are still investing with us. But, uh, you know, it's interesting that we're coming to a time where, where these fraction of replacement value buys are, are more available and especially investors who've been with us through prior downturns, they recognize that and what our pattern is. So uh, the last thing I'll say is, um, is interesting about uh, six or seven months ago, um, we were having management team meetings about developing two large new investment fund strategies. And we were debating on whether it was the right time in the market to do it. And, um, trying to decide if it was, and uh, you know, because all of us knew we were getting towards the the peak of of a market cycle. And I remember telling our team that if I had the magic wand, so to speak, uh, I and could control market timing, which I I can't obviously, which I could. But uh, I remember telling our team if I could, uh, we'd launch these funds and begin developing the relationships for the funds, but not raise a lot or deploy a lot until we see the next downturn starting to happen. And of course, it happened much more dramatically and from a cause completely different than any of us expected a, a serious black swan event here. But um, several investors I've spoken with during this crisis in the last couple of weeks, uh, they see this as the beginning of opportunity to deploy significant capital, particularly in areas like multifamily housing, which is what we're focused on, as you mentioned, where they see it as a, a, safer, uh, a safer alternative and that there might be some some great discounted buying opportunities. In fact, we're already seeing some of those discounted buying opportunities happening now. So that's a, a quick summary of, of our, our perspective on what we're hearing from investors. And a little bit similar for you, Moses, uh, but we'll maybe focus a little more on COVID-19. How will COVID-19 affect the real estate markets in general? We do understand or would perceive that office space could be gravely challenged, but again, there's also going to be opportunity. When I described you, it mentions malls, and people must have said malls with retail. Isn't that going to be incredibly challenged? But you have a very creative perspective about how that could be a very dynamic marketplace moving forward. Yeah, first, thank you for having me. But I think Lani is right because I think the time there's a pre COVID. Um, condition and a post-COVID condition. You have the pre-COVID condition of pe people have the notion, oh, COVID is going to destroy everything. I think what we, we have seen a lot of challenges across the spectrum on any, um, any form of real estate, whether it's office, multifamily, each individual had their own challenges uh, pre-COVID-19, which sort of would have been a long drawn up process of, of a healing process and going into a better timing. I think COVID-19 sort of created the, 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 the concept of ripping off the Band-Aid and sort of moving on, weeding out all the old problems and moving into a better concept. I mean, if we can go into um, a little bit, the multifamily market is dealing, and especially I know uh, I've heard Lani was saying he's dealing with second tier markets, but I think in core cities, they're dealing a lot with rent regulation reforms, which has technically slashed tremendously uh, valuations of all these assets, which would have been probably challenging when their debt is due and, and it comes time to repay these loans, how are they gonna refinance and so on. 
but um, the same as uh, with retail. Retail are competing with, um, you know, with uh, uh, online e-commerce. Restaurants are competing with with potentially cloud kitchens. Now, all of these, so COVID-19 sort of created a, a, an understanding, sort of, first of all, offices are shut down, people can go to work, so they're realizing they don't need that massive space uh, in the office spectrum. Um, you have uh, retail, uh, big retail boxes are more uh, gearing now more towards online business. Restaurants are gearing more towards cloud kitchens. So all of those are a sort of, um, Substantiating the, substantiating the fact that has already ap happened over the past five years, and it's slowly, maturely changing the spectrum of real estate use and the landscape of real estate. But COVID, post COVID nineteen, will sort of it, it's already an, an a, a reality, and people will sort of change accordingly. So we have actually been monitoring these and and sort of focusing on these type of concepts and changing. Um, you know, the use of retail, the use of office space, and focusing more on developing a, a mixed lifestyle on a micro concept level. Smaller offices, um, food markets, um, you know, even focusing more on industrial micro concept and industrial because Cloud Kitchen will be using a lot of this industrial concept, um, shared living space, um, um, uh, shared. Um, office space, workspace, and so on. The micro concept is actually growing tremendously. And uh, most uh, people want to live, work, and play within the same vicinity and have that opportunity and that lifestyle. So I think that's where, uh, you know, that's where the market was already shifting and adapting over the course of years, but it sort of became a reality with COVID-19 as our situations keeps us bound to our home we have to work at home, we have to work remotely, uh, we have to order food from the cloud kitchen, we have to order our, our goods from, from online business. So it's gonna be sort of a, a it's becoming a reality and all these uh, real estate users, tenants will, will start adapting and start restructuring their nature of business, whether they'll downsize um, on, on the office space, downsize on the retail concept and gear more towards um, other alternatives. So you have millennials and Generation Z, although Generation Z being a little young, but we'll, we'll lump them in. Uh, they have a different perspective than people from other generations. They're getting married later. They're having smaller families. Uh, there may be a little bit more concern than my generation or ones prior about our future moving forward. So them making deeper commitments, meaning buying a home, appears to be more limited to them. In theory, you would think that would be beneficial for a time to you doing multifamily housing. Are you seeing almost increased competition for rentals and units? And what are factors that you look at in terms of when you're making a decision to rent? Yeah, so, you know, we, we acquire older multifamily properties, usually, you know, 30 to $100 million purchases and uh, renovate them, improve them, and do that in a way that uh, significantly impacts the lives of our residents. And uh, what we're finding is that there is a continual shortage of uh, workforce housing, which is what our, our real focus is, is workforce housing. And the demand for multifamily assets, which is what you're, I think, getting at, remains very solid and I think will potentially increase as a result of this. You know, before the coronavirus, our country had a severe housing deficit, especially for accessible workforce housing. In fact, the word crisis was often used to describe uh, the shortage of affordable and attainable housing. But these days, the pandemic crisis has certainly stolen the headlines. <laughs> that's, that's the only crisis people are thinking about now, and understandably. But many of us expect the U.S. housing deficit will get even worse. You know, I, I, I do have four millennial children, as you know, Angelo, and a few of those who are married. So that means we have a lot of friends who are millennials because we like, you know, hanging around our, our kids and their friends. And, and really, many millennials uh, already had anxiety about buying a home as a result of uh, the Great Recession. And I think the COVID-19 crisis will actually culturally reinforce those fears 
about how fleeting employment can be in a crisis. So this next generation of household formations will be even more likely to um, rent rather than own. Plus, you know, in this environment, there's a lot of new construction projects that are not yet out of the ground or um, completely stopped or shelved for months to come. So it appears likely that we're going to see this formula for continued increasing renter demand and potentially even less apartment supply to meet that demand. So, you know, obviously from our perspective as, as investors in this asset class, that bodes very well for the stability and continued growth over time. You know, certainly, you know, we're going to see some downward pressure during this point in time on, on rents, which we can talk about that if, if you'd like. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, if, if there is any good news out of COVID-19 for investing, this is one area where one could find a silver lining that it appears that apartments uh, seem to be very strong candidates for solid investments coming out of this crisis. And like I said, well, there, there clearly will be some near-term challenges. I think uh, most investors who have some experience in this space know that multifamily real estate will continue to show very good resiliency and very solid growth over time here. Yeah, per the dynamics that I mentioned, that would logically appear to be a case, unless there comes a point when there's too much supply relative to even what likely is going to be a bit of increasing demand, then it goes back the other way in terms of the rentor uh, having additional flexibility and options. But we'll jump into some of those issues in rent, like you said, in a second. Uh, Moses, you said a couple of interesting things that might have been a little bit more industry talk. So for those listening in that may not have been as familiar, Cloud Kitchen, and that's the way all restaurants effectively now, at least in California, New York, and many other locations. And you mentioned the word micro. Uh, if you could describe those in a little bit more detail to our audience. So micro concepts is basically a scaled down concept from the typical type of, of um, you know, spaces that we have seen in the past. Um, now, if we talk about, let's say, restaurants, what are the reasons people go out and, and utilize a restaurant is A, because they need to, uh, you know, put fo uh, food in, the, in their belly. Uh, the other thing is social networking and, and entertainment purposes. So entertainment will, as long as the economy is decent, people have money in their pocket, they constantly go out and, and would like to entertain and socialize and be out, out and about but it's for the purpose of actually picking up your food instead of going into walking into a restaurant or sitting down in a restaurant grabbing a quick bite of lunch uh, especially in the fast food market you will see a tremendous change as people are i mean i have a vision where um you know what we do we create some of these these mixed use properties we create these workspace for the tenants which increases the value of the of the the units by itself you know they sit in their uh workspace at home because they're, they're not really home but they're downstairs they order food on the cloud kitchen those will will continue to grow at a rapid pace and especially post COVID 19 as these fast food restaurants are anyways gearing to that uh type of business because they're just unable to operate and be open so their only form of business is through um Cloud kitchen. So think about the fast food restaurant, which is situated in a high density area and expensive price per square foot. Those don't need to be anymore in that location. They'll relocate to an industrial building. They'll re relocate to, a, to an industrial building on the seventh floor. They don't need to be in a physical, you know, walking street level where the business model has is changing over the course of the years. So. Um, so anything that sort of creates a micro concept. So the only thing what we're gonna do is, we're gonna sort of create anything that sort of relates around entertainment. So food market, such as a Chelsea market, is a very successful concept, literally cross country. It's been opening up and popping up in various different locations, depending on the density of each, uh, each location and the foot traffic that they can capture. So that's where it depends on the demographics and so on. But, but the concept is a phenomenal acceptable concept where it creates entertainment, it creates affordability for, for uh, the restaurant operator because it's a small space that they operate. They have the common space to share with all the other food vendors. Um, 
young millennials coming out of culinary college looking for a new business to get into. They have the opportunity to get into these food markets. It's cheap, uh, it doesn't cost them anything. Usually these developers build up a space for them. And it also creates an environment, a, a, a lifestyle of, if you're in a mixed use environment where you live, work, and pain in that concept. Um, for example, another example on the micro concept is you see a lot of these strip malls are literally losing tremendous amount of, of ten. It's more of the apparel and, and, and uh, you know, whatever they're selling. So you see also a pop up, a huge pop up on, on um, urgent cares. Urgent cares are literally mini hospitals. And the hospitals are, I mean, the health system are encouraging for all these urgent cares because the ER, the emergency rooms are overpopulated and they can't service the, all the walk-ins. So urgent cares is a huge um, uh, sort of fill-in for walk-in instead of in lieu of emergency care. Um, so that's sort of popping up. So anything within this form, and I think um, mini storage goes into the, to the micro concept as people are sort of adapting more to co-living minimizing their space, moving out of their offices. Uh, mini storage is a huge, is gonna be a huge demand. What are some of the many changes that will impact the dynamics of real estate broadly? Uh, one being telecommuting, meaning people are gonna be traveling less. Are people investing more in their home environments? Uh, not traveling to crowded places? And won't technology and new tech benefit? I know we're getting a little bit outside your realm relative to multifamily housing, but would love to hear some of your opinions about that. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to share. I've got opinions. Uh, everybody's got a lot of opinions these days. We're all reading as much as we, as much as we can until we're sick of reading opinions. But, um, and, and we talk about this a lot on our, on our team because um, we're always looking for what are the next trends. And, you know, I think to, to, to understand that, question and the potential answers, you have to look at it by, um, by lifestyle sector, by asset class. Um, so maybe I'll just, I'll start by just running through some of the asset classes because, um, and maybe talk a bit about technology uh, at the end here, uh, or maybe Bill will be on by then. But, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, as, as Moses referred to, there were some sectors of real estate that um, were already kind of starting to fall out of favor. Um, before COVID-19, and this has certainly accelerated that. I think a, a lot of people have uh, paradigm changes that were in process that this has accelerated. So, I mean, one of those, for example, one of the most battered asset classes during this COVID-19 triggered shutdown uh, has been the, the luxury hotel market and uh, the travel industry and uh, events and things like that. We're, we're invested in one... Um, Luxury Marriott Hotel that's closed right now, along with a significant portion of the hotel sector, um, and so you know clearly that is a is a high risk, short term play. <laughs> but if you have a lot of experience in hospitality and and are really opportunistic, um, there will certainly be some great buys in that uh, sector. And uh, you know I think hospitality is one of those that has been at risk um, for some time. Uh, because of the the pressure from newer lodging models like Airbnb, uh, for example. Um, so I would say there are uncertainties about about the future of of, of that sector and the future of people's um, travel patterns and vacation patterns, not just short term but longer term also. Um, you know, Moses, you alluded to this. I think there's real questions about the the office sector. Um, the, the temporary work from home shift that's so dramatic right now for every company, um, there was already a shift, a cultural shift in corporations towards that being acceptable. And it certainly wasn't our company. We're very decentralized with hundreds of employees in many states. Um, but what's interesting is there, there were a certain segment of our employees. We thought they just, they just have to be together or this won't work. And, you know, we had a team meeting just this last week where you know, we were saying, you know, I, I think we might actually be as productive and maybe more productive in this scenario. So, you know, things like those thought processes could lead towards some challenges for the office real estate sector as em employers like us and many others consider whether to more permanently adopt some of these teleworking policies. Um, I wish Bill was on to talk about student housing. I know he's done some of that recently. We've owned and operated a lot of 
a lot of student housing over the years. Um, and I would say there are, are some real questions about even again, pre-COVID-19, there, there was a pressure on the educational systems for a more decentralized approach and non-traditional approaches. And that certainly has increased now. I was talking with the CFO of, of our local university this week and you know, they're, they're, they're actually, you know, quite concerned about that, that the, the increasing trend toward online education and non-traditional decentralized off campus, or to Moses point, micro educational communities will definitely impact student housing going forward. Um, so, you know, that, that's one of those trends you just have to watch and say, you know, if you're going to invest in, in a, you know, a several hundred units student housing complex that's being built on a campus, will the demand really be there going forward? And, you know, there's, there's arguments on both sides of that, of course. Um, we'll talk a bit about senior housing. Uh, we've had a team of over 2,000 employees um, on our payroll just in senior housing alone. So we had a lot of experience in that realm, and this, this is forcing some interesting tent. So I, I would say, you know, senior housing, uh, uh, although it, it's, it's probably still a decent and maybe a, a very good long-term investment play because of the, you know, we, we can't uh, change the, the demographic trends and the aging of, of the population. But, um, you know, there's, there's certainly some questions about uh, the, the risks now, the additional risk that's in people's minds and that people, people were already moving their, their loved ones, their parents and grandparents uh, later at, at um, later stages of acuity, uh, even pre-COVID-19, and there's a reasonable chance that that will continue. Um, so, and there were already several markets, many markets that were already overbuilt in senior housing, so um, occupancies were already fairly low uh, relative to historic trends pre-COVID-19. Um, so, I would say, you know, industrial and logistics is an interesting play, kind of micro-industrial and logistics will probably benefit from this crisis and the aftermath um, for, for all kinds of reasons that most of you are well aware of with uh, so much going online now. Um, but who knows how that sector will morph over time. And, and that's, we've invested in all these we've done, we haven't done anything in logistics, so I really can't speak to that. Um, so, you know, I, I would say uh, from our perspective, the, the uh, technology, play um, will become uh, a more significant impact on real estate values over time for in, in different in different ways in each of these asset classes. Um, but as as people are used to becoming increasingly used to relying on technology and this this crisis has accelerated that reliance on technology. Um, I think you really have to look hard at whatever industry you're investing in how technology could affect that in the future um, based on trends right now. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different game than it was. Even, even locations, I would say, uh, you know, we, I was talking with several industry experts uh, this week, um, institutional uh, players in real estate, and we were all just talking about how, how we're looking at location differently now. Location has always been important real estate investment, obviously but we're looking at that even differently now than we were before. And, um, you know, there, there's, there's even more value in the right locations now. So in, in our case, apartments that are located in stronger locations, uh, our collections are much higher. Um, and that's, that's typically the case, but it's, it's more exaggerated right now. And uh, there are some locations that have been fed by um, for instance, the, the, the core business sector being very strong there and the office sector being very strong, that even the ripple effect on multifamily in those locations may be significant. So a lot of new factors to consider in this environment, for sure. And we will check back in one more time. Uh, Bill Lapis. Bill, are you with us? Uh, the other thing that we're noting, and again, more so going to be impactful to a future audience in the podcast, and this is the risk with having multiple participants and a lot of live listeners today, which is what we've been doing mainly in COVID-19, but today, because real estate's a popular subject, it's uh, a lot of people on the line. There's a little bit more background noise than normal. Again, if you're not a participant, it got better in the last couple of minutes, but if you're not a participant... Uh, if you could put yourself on mute, that would be preferred. 
Uh, on that note, since, again, I don't know this uh, bill yet, and some of these questions could be most apropos to him, we'll switch over to Moses. So things like office space, retail, restaurants, theaters, traditionally, those are the ones we believe are going to be the most impactful. Uh, what could potentially benefit? Well, you were creative, noting micro uses, multifamily storage, possibly more manufacturing coming back to the U.S., but that may be a little bit more of a longer term play. As a real estate owner and for those on the phone, how would you recommend that they adapt and how do they adapt when they often have leases and arrangements as you might have with people from industries that are going to be gravely impacted and not going to pay and the process of I hate to say the word getting them out because that's a bit of a process and it may change in a couple of months. As a real estate operator, this must be a difficult time. Okay. So it's definitely going to be a challenging time um, from a perspective of the real estate operator. I mean, beyond what uh, each individual business will suffer and go through their business model, whether they can re remain open and stay in business and so on. Um, you know, if you have, uh, uh, if you have, let's say, fine, if you have debt on your projects and you can't pay the debt, there's going to be many, many changes over the course of the next couple of months. Now, if real estate, if retail operators, if they can't stay in business, they will obviously move out. I mean, if they move out, your space becomes vacant. Now, to go find new tenants will be very challenging because who would rent in a market like this? Like this? you know, to change and continue with the same format. So, so there's going to be a tremendous challenge transition into going forward and what the landscape is going to be look like over the next year or so. But it would be better to have it this way as sort of, you know, uh, in a more an accelerated version opposed to having this drawn up. As these would have transitioned regardless. So I think, um, you know, it, it, I don't have all the answers and it's, it's, it's tough. It's going to be a tough, it's going to be a tough time, but I think it's going to be a lot, it would, it's a lot better that's being done, that sort of it's happening in, in this way opposed to happening in a spread out time over, the, over a couple of years. Well, it certainly is being very concentrated. I think we might have figured it out on my side with Bill. Bill, are you with us? Angelo, can you hear me? You sound crystal clear. It's great to have you back. Oh, right. And your perspective is going to be intriguing given your years of experience, broadly investment experience, including equities, and your transition into being more active in real estate, but being nimble, specifically in self-storage, which may do fantastic during a time like this. So for you, it may be multifaceted. Uh, the opportunity in self-storage and technology and new tech, how that's going to benefit and how the dynamics during COVID-19 and post will be uh, new in the world of real estate in terms of what works and what perhaps doesn't work as well. All right. Well, first, thank you very much, Angelo, for having me on. I think this is a great panel and, and certainly a, a very timely subject. Um, and it's great because we all have very deep experience in our respective uh, real estate fields. Um, I think that storage specifically is successful built around life changes. And, and obviously, there are a, li a lot of life changing events going on right now related to um, the COVID issue and the, the many issues that stem from that. Um, we have, we have <clears throat> done a lot of interesting research in the last couple of weeks um, related to how our facilities did in the past during the financial crisis and what markets uh, tend to do better um, in the GDP of various markets across the U.S. <clears throat> and then, you know, layering on the technology that's available today to be able to, um, as an example, have somebody come and rent a unit without ever having to speak or see anybody. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty tremendous. That was not available in the past. Uh, but now with kiosks and online and all of that, people can actually, you know, rent a unit. Uh, they don't have to even speak to anybody. They can do it all from their mobile phone, um, move in, move out, 
whatever they need to do. Um, and so we anticipate that um, what's happening with COVID is going to accelerate a, a couple of different themes that uh, we see in the U.S. Um, naturally occurring, such as retirements. Uh, we know that there are a lot of early retirements happening now. Uh, many companies are um, offering retirement packages to their employees um, to leave early. And so we think that we'll continue to see growth specifically in the Southeast and in the South of the U.S. Um, as people retire um, prematurely out of uh, markets where they live and might be in the Northeast or anywhere in the North where it's cold and snows, uh, we may see a lot of movement into the South, be it Texas, Florida, Georgia, uh, traditional states where a lot of people have been retiring to, um, but I think we'll see an acceleration because we're anticipating uh, multiple millions of early retirements. Um, along with that, of course, and as Lonnie indicated earlier, uh, people will work differently as well. Um, and so you'll probably see more people working from home um, or from a WeWork space uh, for the social distancing, et cetera. And so uh, for self-storage, again, it's movement, and um, this helps our industry quite a bit. Um, we have not um, seen any uh, downticks in our business. Um, you know, most everybody pays auto pay. It's, it's one of the smaller utility bills they pay every month, so it's not a big issue. Um, we will anticipate probably there'll be a little bit of uh, weakness at some point but not much, and then we'll most likely anticipate an uptick, at least on a national level. Um, in student housing, uh, which is very interesting, and it's a field that we're involved in, and of course with the universities now closing, um, and also closing now their summer classes, uh, we're hoping that they uh, will come back for fall. That seems to be the story, that they will reopen for fall. And, um, but that's going to be interesting. And so we've had a, a slight uptick in occupancy because kids want to go home. Um, not many, though, it was interesting. We were anticipating much more, and it's, um, you know, less than 5%. Uh, so that's, that's very good. And I don't know how it is on a national level, but I know within our properties, um, that's the statistic. So, um, so that's good, and I think that, you know, if universities reopen in the fall, um, that'll be good. Uh, I think it'll be somewhat um, business as usual, uh, unless, you know, they minimize class sizes or they do more staggering, which could be. But um, uh, we think that uh, people will want to continue to get an education. They'll want to continue to have the college experience. Um, the social aspect of it as well, although that may uh, change a little bit for the time being. Um, but I think that uh, there's much more demand. As we speak to students that are finishing classes online, um, they find it a bit dry and, and boring and look forward to uh, going back to a more normal environment. Um, so, th so that's been our experience um, over the last few weeks here. And I'm going to ask you a follow-up question, Bill. I'm going to lead into it with a comment, and I'm going to be a little hard-hitting relative to real estate. So we had a guest on last week, a very well-known person in the world of finance, Adam Robinson, that noted there's been pockets of time globally where for decades real estate did not have positive growth. Now, maybe this is more perspective on don't go about this on your own, have professionals that have expertise in real estate and real estate could tend to be very uh, geographical to given areas. It's different in Seattle than it may be in New York, in Miami, in Tucson, et cetera. Uh, but you could also make the argument relative to colleges 
that the dynamic of technology, that these universities are going to be forced to team up with technology companies, technology is going to get way better on augmented reality, partially due to COVID-19. And could I make the argument that the whole dynamics of education in this country and around the world is not only ripe for disruption, this is forcing it to happen. And although student housing has been attractive for a fair number of years, is it potentially in for a downward spiral? Now you bring up some good points. People are social beings. You're not noticing a lot of the students wanting to go back home. I can make a couple of jokes about that. Part of them is they think they're indestructible. They like the social interaction with their friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, in whatever, and that may be negative from spreading the COVID-19, but the longer term play of what I said, don't you think that could have a negative impact on student housing? It, it, it certainly could if it plays out that way. Um, I, you know, imagine when you're 18 or 19 or 20 years old, the last place you wanted to go back to was home. <laughs> so, exactly. I, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, again, all of us being social beings, um, things may be altered, classes may be staggered so that there, um, you have more social distancing in a class, but um, kids want to be on their own. They want to be um, in the environment. They want to be able to interact, um, not just on social media with their friends, but, you know, in reality. Uh, so I, I think that at the end of the day, that will win over. Um, but will it change student housing? You know, again, uh, as we all know, real estate is very, very local. And so, you know, you may have a student housing complex that's, you know, a mile from the school, and they may suffer as opposed to the student housing complex that's right across the street from the school, um, just because uh, you may see a downtick in, you know, maybe 10% or something of that nature of, of students not being able, perhaps for financial reasons, to stay in student housing. So everybody will gravitate towards the premier property, um, be it the closest one or the one with the best amenities. And, you know, a lot of our students don't have cars, of course. So our properties tend to be um, right across the street from the campuses. And I notice that that makes a very big difference. Um, we have a fair amount of international students and they typically never have cars. So they were always looking for the property that is um, easy, easy to walk to from campus. And, um, and so we always try and position ourselves between the retail and the campus being as close as possible to the campus. And I think that gives us a little bit of buffer. But you know, when I look at my competitors that might be three quarters of a mile to over a mile away from campus, um, Students without cars typically do not stay in those properties. And so if the economy uh, and if the economics of a student get tighter, they may not afford to have a car. You know, they may bike it or, you know, most likely the properties that are closest are going to succeed while some of the other ones have higher vacancies. And let's switch over. Thank you, Bill. A little bit to Moses, and again, asking kind of an uncomfortable question. We're trying to pay the picture that's fair, the challenges, yet the opportunities. But as a real estate operator, uh, yourself and others on the phone, you guys might have mortgages and notes on the property to banks and institutions. You might have tenants that simply aren't paying. And that whole process of managing that, payments that you need to make with payments that you expect to get, that you're not getting, that not only may it be bad policy to kick them out, that sometimes takes, I don't know, three months, six months, a year. There's not necessarily an easy answer for this. How do you as an operator negotiate with the lending institutions flexibility that you might need and negotiate to some degree with tenants that you have that mutually you may all need to adapt? I think um, it, it all comes down to the relationship of what you have with your with your lender, and I think it's important to make to have those conversations. Um, each individual, um, you know, situation is different, and the best way is not to um, sort of abuse that uh, the situation that we're in right now and just utilize it just for the purpose of to gain for you to have as personal gain. 
But if you're in a situation where you don't have a choice and you have, let's say, tenants, half of your tenants are not paying and, and you can't make your mortgage payment, is definitely you should have a sit down with your, with your lending officer and have a conversation about that, how to sort of um, work out a, a, um, you know, a deferral payment option if, if it's a government uh, backed um, you know, notes or something like that. But there's definitely, this, this is where we come back is, is it depends on the project and the asset that you have. You have an over leverage if you're in a high density area, if you're in a low income type of situation and you are over leveraged, there's going to be, uh, you know, challenges for real estate operators where they uh, you know, they may have to sort of let things go and, and walk away depending on, on, on their situation, the financial situation. It all depends where you're located. It's, it's, it's almost like it's a loaded question and it's, there's no situation equal one with the other. I, I think in, in, uh, in uh, areas where, um, where operators are over leveraged, and they already have those rent regulation reforms already enacted in those cities. Um, those are the those are going to have a lot bigger challenges because once it comes to a point, if you want to defer your payments and or so on, or you get into default, now the lenders are going to start looking at the underlying asset and see where the value lies. And if we all know that all these uh, rent regulation reforms has sort of slashed the equity or slash the valuation and the property, lenders might think, hey, this asset is underwater. We might have to do something. Uh, we can't keep it on our books because the bank, we all know banks have to balance uh, assets versus debt unless they deposit a, a lot of cash. So in, in second tier markets where, you know, where um, COVID-19 hasn't hit that bad or it's not as dense and you're not over leveraged, you may have an easier way of sort of um, be, um, working your, your, your budget a little bit, um, you know, uh, let a couple of people go in your, within, within your employees and work things around and work out the payments and all the utilities and all your budgets and stuff like that. But if you're over leveraged and you're in a situation where you have to sit down with your lender and your value of the asset has, has decreased, you may have a, a situation. That's where I think the post-COVID-19 opportunities, that's where most people who have the cash are, you know, are going to take advantage of those situations, whether they'll partner up, whether they negotiate with lenders, buy off debt on a cheaper, you know, on, on, on discounts and so on. There's going to be a lot of, um, it's going to be sort of a, a, a recycle and a reset here. And, and sort of, um, uh, you know, scale down the high pricing to a certain extent where we become, maybe come back to normal. This is where COVID-19 may be a good thing, what happened to the real estate market. Excellent points. And those of you that are listening in live, again, if you want to use the chat feature in Zoom and I could read your question, now would be a good time as we'll go to Q&A relatively shortly. Alani. Also, a little bit of a difficult question for you. Uh, we discussed the potential, the demographic benefits of multifamily housing appear to be very strong, but COVID-19 is putting one tremendous challenge on that. Likely, these are people that are not ultra, ultra wealthy. Again, they're not necessarily homeowners. You could argue they don't have the debt of a mortgage. So <laughs> maybe that does work a little bit in reverse. But what I'm basically getting at is COVID-19 is probably impacting them financially. They're perhaps in a position where they can't make a rent payment. So you also are going to have that little bit of the uncomfortable, very similar to what I asked to Moses on more of the commercial front. How do you negotiate with your lenders? How do you you mainly treat your tenants that are often going to have tremendous rights in various states and cities that they may be in as well. You have a very difficult balancing act here. How are you doing it? Yeah, great question. Um, first of all, because we felt like we're getting at the peak of the economic cycle in, in recent years, we've repositioned almost all of our investments to be now almost fully in multifamily. So I'll, I'll speak from that, that asset class's perspective and um, almost all of our debt that we have on all our multifamily real estate investments 
is agency debt. So Freddie and Fannie debt. And we've got maybe we've got some where we have an institutional co-investor where they also are, are a lender. And of course, those interests are aligned. So that's no problem. But you know, as most of you know, you know, Freddie and Fannie are providing uh, significant forbearances to lenders, to borrowers uh, if needed. Um, we haven't had to take advantage of that and, and doubt we'll, be, we'll, we'll need to. Um, so, uh, and, and ours is, you know, long-term, you know, typically 12 year fixed rate debt. So uh, we typically position our debt very conservatively. So when we get to a time like this, we can hold through a downturn. We've been through a couple downturns. So we, 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 we try and learn from it each time we go through this. So, you know, when you have, you know, long-term fixed rate, uh, relatively low interest, non-recourse debt, on your properties, um, that takes away much much of the concern there. I would say for us, the 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 thing we're watching more closely is is collections, right? Um, the the unemployment uh, impact is, is significant, and we don't yet know how that will really play out. I mean, the gravity of the dramatic unemployment growth is staggering, I and mean, we we've never seen anything like this. Um, I, I think. Since the Great Depression, um, more than what puts the count up to now, 22 million some Americans have lost their jobs and applied for government aid, and the real number of people out of work is probably significantly higher because many haven't been able to even claim uh, yet. So uh, layoffs continue to mount, um, and in just about every sector of business. Um, so. You know, we, we did a, for instance, I'll tell you some things we're doing. We did a survey of our residents uh, a couple weeks ago to understand how we could help them during this time. And one of the questions we asked was how likely they felt they would be to lose their job or have a reduction. And, you know, responses varied from community to community. Of course, again, real estate so location dependent. But typically it was in that 10 to 20 percent of our residents were feeling like they were likely or very likely to lose their job. Um, and, and that was a couple of weeks ago, so that could change going forward, right? And uh, we know that the disaster relief package does include, um, you know, expanded and, and super enhanced unemployment insurance coverage uh, that, that many will be able to receive and some are already receiving. And in some cases, it's above what they were making. I mean, I've, I've got friends whose employees don't want to go back to work for them because they're making more on unemployment. Um, so, you know, certainly um, these measures should provide people and businesses uh, at least a pause, we hope, to steady ourselves, um, stay in their homes and remain afloat during this national emergency. Um, and and they're, I think they're starting to do what they were designed to do to, to allow the economy to function uh, at least um, without completely crashing. But here's the question. We, we know it's, it's going to take time for all the federal financial relief to make its way to all the struggling households. So we're doing all that we can. In the meantime, we're, we're freezing rent increases, uh, we're waiving late fees, um, we're, we're deferring rent uh, as needed, we're working out payment plans to help renters weather the storm. We've been very proactive in communicating with our, all our thousands of residents on this. Um, so, I, I, and, and what we're seeing happening is that the, the CARES Act is certainly helping um, but from, from a real estate investor's perspective, the question is whether this will be enough to help the property industry endure the shock it's still yet to suffer. I mean, I think we haven't seen the full shock, and there may be a couple waves here, but the, the trillions of dollars being pumped into the economy and the unemployment benefits on steroids here, um, that's all great, but the looming question is whether this will be enough for renters to really ultimately be able to afford rent. So. We're watching our collections more closely than ever. Uh, our April collections um, were better than we thought they would be. Uh, most of our properties are at like 95% plus of April billings. Um, we, we, we have a process for residents to, to request uh, deferral and uh, we've had less than 3% of our residents that have asked for April rent deferral in writing. Uh, we know there's probably more verbal requests and just a handful have asked for May, but that could change in May. So um, let me let me just um, end the the thought on this topic with this this uh, concept because I think from the the we're real estate investors from the real estate investors perspective the real question is what will happen to property values 
if a large number of renters aren't able to pay their rent for a period of time. This is true in you know, any asset class we have renters. Um, and for us, it's, it's a large volume of renters and multifamily. So one of the elements that I really appreciate about particularly residential real estate as an investment asset class is that its value isn't entirely judged by short-term rent rolls. Um, there's no question that in the short run, we will see a drop in collections and even rents and probably a leveling, leveling off uh, to, in some markets of rents after that. And that perceived values will fall. I mean, some, some early evidence of that is if you just look at the beating that, that REIT values have taken lately. But what we have to keep in mind that the underlying cause of this is really a, a natural disaster, uh, not a financial crisis. This is different than things in the past. And, and any major natural disaster causes some financial challenges for a period of time. But the fundamentals, is, that's what, what always counts when you're doing invest, investments, and the fundamentals of supply and demand and capital flows are in place, at least in multifamily for sure. And after the natural disasters pass and whatever uh, rebuilding is done after any natural disaster, the chances of the financial, financial crisis passing is, is reasonably good anyway. The, this financial crisis isn't caused as much by a flaw in the financial capital as some prior financial crises have been. It's primarily caused by um, its effect on, we'll call it human capital, on, on humanity, which has been dramatic. So the volatility of the markets and the pause in transactions that we see, I think is it's primarily a reflection of uncertainty. We've never been down this fast before, right? There's, there's no data on what we're experiencing. We're, I mean, our team is just grasping for any developing data we can find on this. But what we do know is that that uncertainty will pass <laughs> and people's memories tend to be fairly short and tens of millions of people will still want and need a home to rent. So from our perspective, yes, it's, it's a storm, it's a crisis. Every person has to deal with that in their own unique way. Um, but we're still very bullish. In fact, in, in many ways, more optimistic now than we've been in, in uh, quite some time for the future of opportunities in residential rental real estate in particular. I have a, a couple of comments that will take it to the home stretch and not necessarily to disagree. That was relatively a rosy picture, which is good to be an optimist in terms of moving forward. But it's very concerning. I would assume that many of the people renting that are going to be younger, the savings rate in this country and around the world for those under 40 is abysmal. It's just terrible. I mean, basically, people can't go, well, of course. you know, missing even one or two paychecks and it creates simply a disaster. That's a different subject. And was the economy as strong as it appeared on the surface? I'm going to argue probably not. If you look at various metrics, I think were, uh, this is a certainly a challenging time. Now, the stimulus, it, yeah, I mean, I guess it's going to be needed. A combination of the CARES Act, unemployment, and the stimulus is going to help put some money in people's pockets, but it's going to absolutely come at a cost. It's going to come at a cost to adding to our massive, massive deficit, multiple tens of trillions of dollars that we have in getting worse, which could inevitably lead short-term to deflation, long-term to inflation, and 100% 100% going to be an increase in taxes and maybe very negative, impactful for capital gains, which could be impactful for real estate. Bill, I hate to lead into you with such a, a rough commentary, but what do you think about what I said and what's going to be that impact on real estate? Well, Angelo, you're exactly right. Um, there will have to be a uh, increase in taxes at some point. Um, you know, this massive spending uh, is uh, significant and, uh, you know, it's not over with, so there's, there's more to come. Um, so it's, it's pretty significant and that does have to get paid for. Fortunately, you know, interest rates are low, so to finance that right now is uh, fairly inexpensive. True. But uh, it is going to affect the economy in the long run and um, just as uh, other disasters that we've had uh, and that we've had to spend trillions of dollars to fix um, have impacted uh, the bond markets, the stock markets, the real estate markets. Um, but I think that, 
you know, you have two different types of real estate. You have uh, what's mandatory and what's discretionary. And right. uh, certainly multifamily is mandatory. Everybody needs a place to live. Um, and that's, I think, priority number one. Um, other than that, uh, everything else is, is can be somewhat questionable. I mean, certainly you need health care. And if you look at the REIT sector, um, it's been obliterated. Um, you know, obviously the uh, travel and leisure sector has been obliterated quite a bit right now. And uh, they're looking for uh, government subsidies. Um, obviously the airlines have received them. Um, hotels are next in line. And um, so there's, there's certain, you know, uh, asset classes that are necessary and those that are much less necessary. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but I, I think that if we go back to uh, the origins of, of real estate and the true benefits are, you know, this, this will all pass. They'll come up with a vaccine. Everything will be back to normal probably within two years. And people will want a nice place to live. They're going to need a place to store their stuff. And they are um, going to uh, want to enjoy a nice vacation. Uh, so travel and leisure will come back. Um, uh, everybody's going to need health care. So the health care REITs, we think, are a, a pretty good opportunity here, uh, whether it's uh, senior living or hospital REITs or medical office REITs, um, that those sectors um, still have good long-term trends to them. And I think that uh, this whole situation has caused our generation collectively, um, anybody from the age of 20 to 80 to think about their life and lifestyle. And um, you may see some interesting trends emerge where people live, move to areas that uh, they enjoy the lifestyle more because now it's a little more acceptable to work from home if they decide to choose that. So that will create an interesting trend, um, which will affect office potentially. Um, Warehousing, we believe, will still stay strong with the Amazon effect. And, uh, and like what Moses is doing, which I think is a, a pretty tremendous opportunity where you're taking a, an old concept, which is a mall, and you're turning it into a mixed use, I think that's a huge opportunity. And that, um, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of big boxes and a lot of pieces of real estate that are going to come to market now with the collapse of retail. Um, obviously, we saw Sears, Kmart, there's more coming. Um, there's a lot of smaller uh, uh, pieces of real estate that are going to come to market from restaurants because many restaurants are not surviving this um, and won't come back. Uh, so it's an interesting impact in the real estate market. And there are many, many great opportunities coming. Um, and we are focused on a few opportunities in particular thematically that we intend to take advantage of um, towards the self-storage side, I'd say more so. And Moses, maybe on that note again, a really intriguing background for those of you that don't know, family in uh, came from a different business relative to manufacturing, to transitioning over to real estate, and then adapting during what we're going through now. You did mention something earlier, basically, to an extent, cash is king, cash on hand. Although it's tempting to use leverage at great rates, it's times like this when that could come back to be a little bit challenging to you. What do you think in the very near future, the advantage of this dislocation in real estate and real estate that was for purposes that are gonna be challenged moving forward, this is gonna create a buying opportunity for operators like yourself to investors, whether through a fund or on their own that could be on the phone or listening in. Uh, what would you, how would you recommend they move forward? Well, I, I, well first of all is um, we always have to constantly evolve and adapt to new trends and, and new changes. If you sort of um, are constantly on the lookout for where, you know, the, the indicator is moving where trends are, are trending uh, and you can't see focused on the market as, I mean, we were constantly looking out, as you mentioned before, I transitioned from, from the garment business into real estate because early on when our family, we had a hugely successful business and literally um, 
within one day to the next, I called a meeting between my family and I said, listen, we got to close down this business. And they looked at me, okay, I understand things have changed a little bit, but we're still doing well. We're still having clients. We're still having all these potential orders that we're working on. Um, so it doesn't make any sense to close down now. So, what, but what I've seen the shift on a huge level from, the, from manufacturing in the United States shifting out out of the country, I felt that if we don't beat this curve right now and do a change now, later on it's going to be too late. So what we did is we, we sold half of our company, we moved half of the company to Mexico, and we actually did very well under the circumstances because if we would have waited a year longer, we would have lost everything. So it, it's challenging sort of to take advantage maybe in, in a time like this, but I think we always have to look back, how do we operate our business? Are we just leading the blind? Are we going with the flow that everyone is doing? Or are we constantly looking how to adapt and innovate? And this is what we have to do, especially in a, in a fast, rapid uh, market where everything is so fastly changing. And over the last five, five years, things have changed from, from uh, you know, from a, uh, you know, everything becomes digitalized, everything becomes more technology based, you know, things are, people are changing the, the nature of, of the way they operate business, the way they do business, the, they, the way they market, the way they, the landscape of the businesses. So it is, it is maybe, um, uh, it feels bad to say that we can take advantage of a market like that. But if you constantly are, are ready and willing and able to adapt and go along with where the trend is, where the flow is, and you can stay ahead of the curve, then, yeah, fortunately, you can take advantage of where people have sort of not foreseen where the market is trending, have not seen, you know, where the, you know, where everything is moving towards a different concept. So um, it's going to be challenging for real estate um, owners and operators because they are, people will lose their wealth, they will lose their projects, but it will also sort of um, reset the tone and we may be going into a better and a newer concept where things will, will evolve and, and prosper and, and much stronger, much better. On that note, I do see we're about an hour and 10 or 15 minutes in and I do have some time constraints. What I'd like to do is go to each participant. If you can make a quick, I insist, 20, 30 second comment, good luck. Uh, but more importantly, right after that, for those that are listening in that would like to learn more about what you're doing, a way that they could connect, whether a website, an email, a white paper that you've done that's posted on the site, a LinkedIn profile, whatever it might be. So a very quick closing comment followed by contact information for those that want to learn more. We'll start with Lonnie. Awesome. Thanks, Angelo. Um, I would just close by saying, you know, whatever you are focused on in real estate investments now, realize we're in a new game and find a way to optimize your investment returns and your impact results. That's been our theme song. We, we believe you don't have to give up positive impact or investment results. Uh, we've been able to demonstrate you can have both and we're doing that even more so these days. So if you'd like to learn more about our, our approach to that, or particularly if you are a family office investor who invests in multifamily real estate um, or an owner operator that does this in a way where you care about impact in particular, as well as good returns, uh, we'd love to learn from you too, if you're already doing some of that. So contact me. My email address is Lonnie, L-O-N-N-I-E at wilkinsoncorporation.com, or you can find uh, us on social media and on Google searches, I'm sure also. Excellent. Moses? Yeah, um, I don't have much to add to more than what Lani is saying, but I think, yeah, you have, you have to be innovative in a market like this or constantly. You have to constantly look out where, you know, where the strength lies, where the weaknesses are and root out, um, you know, those, those, um, those assets that are not performing as well as, as you would hope to early on. Look where the indicators where you know where the nature of business is changing, um, you know, and find where the opportunities uh, opportunities are. Constantly create ideas, innovate your process, 
and which ultimately will, if, if you weather the storm, you'll create a lot of value down the line and you'll survive. And uh, again, uh, thank you everyone for, for uh, being here. Uh, if anyone wants to contact me, my email is Moses at a and M is Apple, A is an Apple, M is an Nancy, M is a Mary group.com. And Bill Lapis. Uh, thank you, Angelo. Thank you for uh, having me on this podcast. I appreciate it. And um, I, uh, I, can, I can be contacted through LinkedIn, uh, William Lapis. I'm on there. Um, my email address is also wlapis at W-R-A-L-L-C. Uh, com. That's our uh, family office and investment arm. Um, and I will say that uh, I think out of all the asset classes I have invested in over the last 33 years, the reason why I like self-storage, it's, it's um, low headaches. Uh, we don't have tenant issues and we don't have TIs. And um, our portfolio over the years, we've um, hit over 30% IRRs, um, which are uh, very strong, and we think that this is a great opportunity right now with what's happening in our country to um, build and develop and acquire self-storage in the states that we think are gonna grow from this uh, situation, and uh, we continue to do what we've been doing for, for many, many years. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and welcome any questions offline um, about what we do. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And thank you, of course, to all our participants in closing. Uh, certainly, real estate has been a challenge, but also potentially opportunistic time during COVID-19 for all the reasons we discussed in today's podcast. Of course, past results is no guarantee of future. Uh, do your own diligence. Real estate specifically is often so, so local. Uh, these are decisions as investors that you'll have to individually make. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles, host of Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast and the founder and CEO at Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to families of great success and their single family offices. We provide a tremendous amount of proprietary content and host pre and post COVID-19, a uh, tremendous amount of global programming. But during COVID-19 and to follow, because I'm liking it so much, we've been doing daily online meetings, peer-to-peer -peer meetings, launching private portals for our families and doing so much to hopefully keep the community together and provide value to our members in our relationships. So again, like our participants said, or using what Moses said from the garment industry to real estate and staying ahead of the curve and adapting is something that I've had to do. Uh, so it's been an intriguing time. Uh, thank you all for either listening or watching in if you're seeing it on video. Uh, I could be reached uh, on social media, very active on Instagram, LinkedIn. My channel on YouTube is simply Family Office and I could be reached at familyofficeassociation.com is the website. And that's Angelo at familyofficeassociation.com as preferred email. Also have a personal website, simply my name, angelorobles.com. On that note, everyone, stay safe. Look forward to next time. Our participants, thank you all so much for being on today. Thank you.